Welcome back. With the same, we are resuming with the next panel. The focus, the topic in focus with this panel discussion is the importance of diversity and inclusivity in PR and communication. And ladies and gentlemen, followed by your round of applause, I would like to invite our panelists for this discussion. Please welcome Shivani Gupta, Managing Partner, SPAG Fin Partner. Harjeev Singh, Founder, Gutenberg. I must ask everyone to kindly offer their loudest applause as we welcome our panelists. Please welcome Nikhil Day, Executive Director at Packers PR. Ashwini Singla, founding managing partner, Astrum. Nandita Lakshman, founder and chairperson, The Practice. Welcome panelists, kindly be seated. Thank you very much. And with the same, let's please welcome the moderator for this session, Jagriti Motwani, CEO and co-founder, Cha Chi. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure uh, to have you all here for this panel, which um, covers a very important topic in today's times. That's diversity and inclusivity. Um, you have been introduced to all the esteemed panelists here. Uh, while we begin on the subject, um, we are all aware that uh, PR is seen as the women's domain. And, um, you know, I'm happy that on the panel today, there are more male speakers than female. Uh, <laughs> so maybe let's begin with that. I would like to ask uh, each of you, maybe starting with uh, Ashwin here, uh, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? And, um, you know, if there is anything further on the subject that you would like to share. Interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, look, coming from a land, India, where diversity is, is a natural part of our culture and character. I think the rainbow uh, reflection of our nation in the workforce is what diversity includes and inclusion means to me. But more importantly, I think it's not about the, the, the collection, but creating the opportunities for that diversity to flower uh, and, and reflect in the in the demographics and the uh, psychographics of our workforce. Let me give you an example. You made a very interesting point uh, talking about the fact that uh, we are now three uh, people on the panel who tend to be males. And I had this very, and, you, and it started with the fact that you are a women dominated uh, workforce, right? So let's break it down. Public relations by its nature, three out of every four professional is a, is is uh, is is a female right but why is it that it does not reflect in the leadership of the public relations industry both in the consulting side exactly and that's really interesting side, right so where does it where does the fallout happen where does it sort of go out and i asked this question at the eco summit uh, where we were in dubai recently uh, and the and i asked a lot of our colleagues young colleagues uh, uh, female colleagues, uh, uh, industry professionals. And the single most important answer they gave us is that they drop out of the workforce because either they get married and they have other priorities or they're difficult, uh, they're not able to come back because they, they, they have children. So there are two sort of uh, turning points in their life, marriage or they have a kid. To my mind, the opportunity that we need to provide is to enable that transition to happen sm so smoothly that we don't have that drop off point, right? So therefore to me, inclusion and diversity is not about the culture, character, but creating opportunities for people to be able to live their lives and also be able to participate productively, at least at a gender level in that way. And then you can sort of take it in, into different forms. I'm very proud to say that at this point of time, three out of four board members of Astrum are, are my female colleagues. We've had three motherhoods, four weddings in the family, and none of our, my people have dropped out simply because we were able to create that balance for them. Right. This is interesting. I move on to Nandita. And uh, Nandita, we uh, would like to know from you, uh, what do you think about diversity and inclusivity? And uh, 
or, you know, anything that you have felt biases in your profession. And today, in today's times, how are you enabling a more diverse environment for your workforce? So for me, diversity, as Ashwini said, we've grown up in a very diverse nation and, you know, with, with diverse culture. So for me, basically, diverse, uh, diversity is really a way of life. Uh, inclusion is really a philosophy. You know, and I differentiate between the two. They're very different. Um, I think I would like to take uh, this whole aspect beyond just male and female because there's just so many aspects, aspects to diversity. And, uh, you know, we have uh, from the very beginning had a very, very diverse workforce in that sense. Gender, ethnicity, language. Uh, in fact, of late, we've been even telling our people, asking our people how many languages do they speak? Because you are now, the work that you do is not, uh, you know, is multilingual, right? So it's very important for us to even appreciate and understand uh, different languages and the nuances of, you know, so many aspects. Um, I want to take it a step further and say that, um, you know, it's just not just talk about our industry, but we represent so many clients who also require to go beyond diversity and inclusion just being an HR tick box. Uh, and therefore, how are we creating campaigns for our clients, keeping all of this in mind? So it's a huge responsibility. And finally, Jagrati, uh, with GWPR, we ran a kind of a survey to find out, you know, how many women spokespeople do we actually see in newspapers, in the media? And it's abysmally low most of the people, even in the banking and finance world, where there's so many leaders sitting in the uh, you know, leadership positions, but when you look at the uh, space, the real estate that the media takes up, um, you know, it's mostly male. So I think we just need to kind of really expand that philosophy. And of course, there's a lot, like I said, if, you know, if diversity in, and inclusion are all a way of life and philosophy, you don't have to do things to make it embedded in the organization. Um, and I can talk about that later. Yeah. Greg, this is interesting. Now I move to Nikhil. Nikhil, Art Factors just completed 25 years of existence. I'm sure you have seen a lot of trends emerge and alter, evolve, change. Um, how do you ensure that in an organization that is, um, you know, uh, more than two decades into existence, how do you ensure that you are able to implement the new ways of working, including diversity, accepting uh, individuals from all races, genders? Thank you. Uh, I'll start with a, a line I read somewhere about what is diversity and how is it different from inclusion that's stayed with me. It says, uh, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance, right? So it's one thing to bring someone in, but then you can leave them hanging there and still make them feel excluded. And coming to where the rubber meets the road from this nice little analogy, um, if you look at the digitization of our business, so I think we are trying to attract more and more digitally savvy, digitally inclined people. And, and we are having to go far and wide outside the talent pool that's existing. And therefore, what I sense is there are about 200 people uh, in our firm who are, quote unquote, in the digital team. And the reality of this struck me when we were sitting to decide who sits where. We've just moved into a new office. Today's our um, sort of inaugural and stuff like that. And when we were thinking about it, I remember... Now, Ashwini, we had attended the Editors of the World Conference a while ago, and there was a story that the editor of Al Jazeera told, which was about how they were trying to integrate digital people into their course, and they had about four digital people then who were sitting in one corner, till the uplink went down, and those people, where's my digital team, I need them, and they were called in. And then they made those people sit in the center of the newsroom. And that was the story that he was telling about the structure of an organization is so crucial to diversity and inclusion. So part of it is structural, right? So you need to make structural changes. So in the new office, I've insisted that we have digital team members 
on each floor uh, in, intertwined. So that's one part of uh, diversity. And I'm just using this because it's a very uh, real uh, situation. But the question you asked me is that what are we doing at Ad Factors to try and bring some of this alive? I would say we've created a millennial board which has 16 members. So trying to give young, ageism is also part of uh, diversity and uh, inclusion. So the younger people, younger voices should have uh, a say. And these 16 members come from North, South, East, West, all the languages that are talked about. Uh, we've looked at sexual orientation. We've looked at gender. Uh, we've looked at religion. We've tried to factor in as many things as we could to give them at least structurally uh, a voice. And now we have to nurture that. That's one of the initiatives that I think uh, we're doing to bring about some kind of diversity and uh, inclusion in the workspace. This is interesting. Thank you. Uh, I move to Shivani now. Shivani, um, uh, what challenges do you feel an organization faces while implementing DNI in its true sense? Of course, working with uh, people who are gender neutral, working with people, um, you know, who probably have a different ethnicity than the majority of people in the organization. Now, it's a new culture shift we are talking about. We are talking about calling them they, them instead of he, she. So talking about these small changes to maybe bigger changes in the culture, what has your experience been? Okay, thank you. So um, I think overall, like you said, cultural shift and, you know, adaptability and culture and things are evolving. And especially, I think, from past couple of years, when we talk about uh, millennials, Gen Z, and how the thinking process and, right, you know, in the uh, lounge, we were just discussing about exactly the same thing, how people think about and uh, behave in a particular set of environment. So yes, I think it is uh, very important for the uh, leaders to kind of adapt to the newer generation thinking, adapt to the new um, ways of working and lifestyle, how they would want to work with in terms of the thinking process, whether the skill sets they come with. It's no longer the same that, you know, we if we have a media relation person and uh, he is just uh, stuck up on just doing the media bit of it, I think it is important for us to understand even within the organization, if the person's skill set is beyond what he has been hired for. So I'm taking it be, uh, beyond the diversity and uh, the point beyond that. So it's for the leaders to adapt and understand how the culture shift has been there, you know, and people are wanting to learn, people are wanting to change their skill set, people are wanting to evolve with the times and people are wanting to uh, adapt to newer uh, environment and skills. So the challenge definitely uh, what I feel the biggest challenge is when you are two different three multi-generational um, you know, workforce is working in the same environment and if somebody is not ready to adapt to that. So yes, organizations and everybody has to work towards it, which is probably like right from, you know, hiring processes, uh, right from working on the you know, the DNI committees that we have working on, uh, um, you know, the training programs and the robust training programs that we talk about. So it is not just for the, you know, the newbies in the uh, system, but it is for the leaders as well. So I think there are, it's a very thought through process and a thought through work in terms of how much, uh, what kind of training program would go for different set of uh, generations and different set of people. So I think it's a continued and evolving uh, employee manuals that you need to work on. There is no one set rule that you can stick to and you can work with that. So yeah, uh, definitely, I think it's an evolving thing. Thank you, Shivani. I move to Harjeev now. Harjeev, you've spoken about what it means, uh, what DNI means, uh, what it takes to implement it in an organization, the challenges and other things. Um, in your career, how have you seen clients um, you know, uh, evolve and also your employees. I'm sure like all of us here work with people across generations. Uh, we work with Gen Zs, we work with millennials, we work with baby boomers also now. Um, and each set responds to DNI in a different way. So what has your experience been there? Sure. Uh, I think what I wanted to sort of maybe put up there for everybody to also think about 
we talk about DNI and particularly in the communications marketing space, we oftentimes see it a lot from our clients when we're doing releases and announcements about how they are sort of adhering to the sustainable development goals by the UN. All of this conversation started about a little over a decade ago when the UN sort of, uh, you know, chartered the UN women to come about, uh, framed the SDGs for 2030 and sort of expanded how we needed to sort of as a world focus on that. The one data point which is very particular to India, uh, which is important, I think, especially a lot of the younger team members here who, who, who are here, in the last decade, we have seen the workforce participation of women in India go from 26% down to 19%. And I would imagine if you looked at that data today post pandemic, it would have gone down further. And while all of the conversations and the messaging that we do as an industry is very good at that level, I think it's very important to realize that outside of the communications marketing space, the participation of women in the workforce is rather low. Is, is there something we can do to change that? Of course, you know, when I look at our own data, we work across four countries. Uh, we have 22 languages we speak across all of our offices. Uh, and, you know, we have a variety of cultures that participate. Uh, so we get a sort of unique view on this uh, outside of India as well. But I think when I just look at the data from a global perspective, we still have a lot of work to do uh, as a country, but also bringing uh, more women into the workforce. And I was looking at some economic data comparing India and China. Women in China contribute 40% of GDP. In India, it's only 17% because of that low participation rate. So India can be a richer country if we can have more women participate uh, in the economy as well. And, and there's a lot of work to do for us. Absolutely, a lot to go. Um, while we talk about it, um, in, in PR also I've seen because of the male and the female ratio, there are men also who face discrimination. Um, sometimes not at her, um, you know, at the level where probably you all are, uh, but when they're starting their career, they may be put in an all women team and they may be, uh, you know, they may have reservations in uh, taking orders from a female boss. Um, I have also worked with people who are gender neutral and, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's challenging for them to adapt to the culture because there are very few people in the organization they can resonate with. Uh, what challenges, Ashwini, um, do you feel uh, have emerged in your organization, if any? You know, uh, my view now, Astrum's my third life. We set up clear, made it successful. Genesis, of course, uh, became the gold standard in public relations. And then uh, now Astrum. One thing that I've consistently maintained over the last 25 years in my career is that you remove the word discrimination of any kind in selection and, and promotion of your talent. At the end of the day, what matters is talent. Right? It doesn't matter the orientation, the religious orientation, the sexual orientation, the gender orientation. When you can remove that, license, uh, that, that lens from, from, from your organization and embed it as a part of your culture at the leadership level, then you will automatically do the right things. Now, whether you want to, to, to set the examples to sensitization training, to do all of them so that people who are not comfortable in that environment become comfortable, that's all par for the course. But first and foremost is, does your character in the organization reflect zero discrimination of any kind? And if you refuse to tolerate that, then automatically it will come. For example, first and foremost, does leadership necessarily need to reflect in age and experience or it needs to reflect in expertise? Question, ageism, as Nikhil mentioned, is an important aspect. You can take away that lens and it doesn't matter the best talent gets promoted, it doesn't matter how old or how young, or whether female, male, or whatever orientation that may be. My, you would say, hey, somebody who's working with documents cannot be visually impaired or cannot be differently abled. My general counsel in Genesis for five years was somebody who was differently abled, was visually challenged. Fantastic lawyer. Today, he's one of the most successful lawyers in a, in a leading law firm, awesome. right? Uh, so it doesn't really matter in my view, 
uh, I remember somebody, a, a young guy, uh, we used to go for this annual on, off-site. Nandita will remember that every Easter we would toodle off to uh, 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 Rishikesh. Till one young guy sent us an email, said, hey, this Lent, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a day when we feel, uh, right? And that day we said, stop. This is, Easter weekend is not going to be the one that we are going to go uh, toodling off and doing our annual offsite because obviously we are insensitive to somebody else's religious feeling. So the question is, if you remove that discrimination of any kind in your organization, then automatically all of this will sort out over a period of time. I can just add to that, Jagriti. I think, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, when I founded the firm, my the first few hires were all, uh, you know, female. Um, even and across the 22 years that we've been in existence, you've kind of seen um, it's skewed towards women, right? So, and now with male colleagues who've gone through the, um, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the, their lifespan of getting married and having kids. And one of the things I always say is, that you know you have to be an equal partner at home, so you need to go out for your PTAs, uh, you know, parent teacher meetings. You have to attend everything, and uh, you know I've seen the struggles of my male colleagues uh, as fathers and trying to be equal parents uh, at home. And I think one of the most important things is as we're trying to create this environment in the office, I think uh, reinforcing the message that. Um, Diversity and inclusion will just be catchphrases if we are not talking beyond and don't take this conversation to society. And, uh, and that, you know, we need to bring that in, the societal conversation into the workforce and also take what we're talking about in the workforce back to society. So there's a huge amount of struggle uh, for male colleagues who are going up the ladder taking on new responsibilities, both in life and at home. So it's real, actually. Right, Nandita, I agree with you here. Now a question for the audience. Um, how many of you, by the show of hands, you can tell me, how many of you have faced any kind of discrimination at your workplace, be it because you're a woman or be it because you're a man who's supposed to show up and uh, you know be available all the time, or a woman who is probably denied a period leave in her organization. Yo. So just three, four, five, six. No? <laughs> you have to change? Question actually. Yes, please. Why you are saying that discrimination is only at the workplace? Discrimination, I think, starts from home. I agree. We are discriminated from uh, at our homes only that we are uh, somehow not permitted or uh, we have within, we have something within, but uh, due to, as everybody said, that due to some responsibilities, due to uh, some work at home, due to taking care of our elders, we are being compressed and we are uh, not, uh, we are not able to come out and show our capabilities to the world. So I think the question is wherever we are uh, being discriminated, whether it's home or whether it's workplace, I think uh, there must be many females. Who You're are right. And I think many aren't showing their hands, but all of them, if they reflect on their lives, they would have felt discrimination at some point or another. Um, Shivani, uh, do you have any instances where you felt discrimination, being a woman in the boardroom? Um, see, um, fortunately, it's not been like that. And when I started my career, it's, um, you know, it has been predominantly a men driven PR industry that time. And of course, when I moved to the corporate ladder, I uh, was with one of the corporates where it was the whole floor was just full of men. And it was more like, you know, the business people and I was the only cop com person there. So, uh, and uh, to my surprise, everybody was like you know very uh, contributing and very supportive of in terms of you know okay a woman is there and in terms of uh, a copcom uh, you know section is there so i think people are receptive about it but to answer her question yes you are right in terms of uh, you know how the conditioning of women is done right from you know like beginning the societal changes 
and over here we are not just talking about you know the me too thing or black lives matter we are talking much beyond that we are talking about you know uh, how uh, the conditioning can change how the skills of uh, people you know how diverse uh, skill set we can bring on board in terms of within the organization and how adaptive people can be and if we are talking about bringing different skill set and again the conditioning set starts from homes conditioning starts from the society so i think uh, when you're talking about challenges definitely whether it's uh, you know men or women i'm sure a lot of people face different kind of challenges and maybe in a you know i just uh, went to see this uh, movie dr g the other day and i saw how he was bullied by women so it's not about that i think it's about how whatever environment or situation we are in it's how strongly we and how uh, positive we are to deal with that so this is how we need to condition ourselves we need to condition our people around us whether it's your um, people at home whether it's your team members and how the whole work starts from you this the whole work starts from us to build that environment so that's what I'm right saying. now i'll take this question to the male members on the panel if you have felt uh the discrimination and if you can share any examples i i definitely have and in this industry uh as we started saying it is one of the few places where i think uh, there are many more women who are naturally uh, attracted towards the industry and i can tell you uh, i can't tell you which companies but i can tell you there have been companies where i have applied uh for a corporate communications role at a senior level so it's not only at a junior level and i've been told quote on quote unofficially that the pr role is a diversity role so don't you don't stand a chance don't even bother to apply okay so that's real uh, and and uh, one has to accept it right because this is one of the few places where i feel uh, a male member is discriminated against but there are many many more uh, where women are but i just want to make one point outside because if you see there are two panels today one was on gender and this is on diversity and i know that the man woman thing gets a lot of air time here but a very very important part i feel of diversity and inclusion in our current post i won't even say post but pandemic uh, environment is around neurodiversity and mental health because there's there's a, a lot of pain and problem hidden under uh, smart outfits and and a smile we've gone through a grueling few years and it's showing up now in the workplace and i feel we are ill equipped to deal with it so when there is a problem to do with i don't know let's say a sexual harassment case there's a posh committee there's a set of prescribed rules you know what you need to do as an organization when i have a team member who is going through a really tough mental uh situation right could be depressed could be uh, harming themselves there could be so many situations that emerge in the workplace i am genuinely struggling to figure out what can i do to to as an organization be most supportive and inclusive and accommodating of them and i know there are answers out there but i think it doesn't get enough attention it's that thing that we say okay we'll we'll, we'll deal with it uh, quietly so i do think neuro neurodiversity and mental health is a big part of diversity and inclusion agree there thank you so. i was very fortunate that i experienced discrimination as a student and not as a professional and interestingly i was supposed to be chosen as the best student in my college but i instant got the most dedicated student award because the best student award had to be given to uh, another student who hadn't got it so to that extent i felt cheated that uh, uh therefore in my mind i go back to to the same point that i made it a purpose of my life to ensure that the only thing that matters in life is merit we need to be creating an environment of equal opportunity without any lenses mental age gender otherwise that's i think number 1 which is the more important part that you should if you if you create an opportunity if you create opportunities for our people to succeed then the best people will succeed and and you don't have to do anything special what you really need to look for is to create a culture of support for anybody who may struggle with those issues and be able to guide them support them 
and not judge them. Look, it can be I'm you know, in a uh, gender diverse environment and I feel that I'm not able to cope with it. Will I re reject that person to say, hey, you can't respect women or you can't work in a women dominated environment, therefore get out. My job is to support vice versa or otherwise. So I think the, the, the two aspects that I would like to say in the end is one, be an equal opportunity uh, uh, environment irrespective of where you come from and create support mechanisms as may be, because in this business, we are in the knowledge business. The only thing that matters is our people. Rightly said, and Ashwin. If, if people are in good shape, they perform well, they have a good environment, they are in good mental health, they are happy com com coming to work, everything is okay. So my focus as, a, as an entrepreneur has always been my people first, no matter what, I will do what need, needs to make sure that they are in a good shape. Great. This is, this is really good to hear. Hajiv. So personally, the, the only discrimination I faced, I, I've spent most of the last 30 years in the US, was racism. Uh, and this was at an immigration going into New York. And the guy who stopped me had a Polish last name. He was American, but clearly his ancestors came from Poland into uh, the US. And I, he was like, this is right after 9-11. So everybody was very sort of uh, up in arms about any foreigner coming into the country. And I said, you know, your last name seems to be not from this land. And, and that's pretty much true of most Americans today, outside of the Native Americans who actually come from there. And he just shut up. He just stamped my thing and let me go. And I think we have to stand up and fight back. To your point, I think the earlier uh, data point I gave, if the women's workforce participation is 17%, we have to first acknowledge that there is a key issue that we all need to work together to kind of push back. And I think this industry is probably the best poise because there are more women in the industry. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from a German playwright, a guy called Bertolt Brecht. And he said about art, he said, art is not a mirror to be held up to reality, but it's a hammer by which to shape it by. And I think this industry has the ability to hammer diversity and inclusion in the minds of not just our clients, customers, but in general about how we can change cultural attitudes and bring people into a, a more diverse environment and, and, and workforce. So to me, that's very important. Thank you, Harjeev. Um, it's almost time to wrap the panel and I'll um, ask you all one last question. That is, uh, you know, mental health as a subject, we did not get an opportunity to discuss it in this panel. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, if there is one advice for you that you can give um, to people building businesses right now, people like myself, we started Chachi about four years back and you all are great veterans I've seen growing up. So any advice for organizations that are nimble and just beginning their lifetime, um, what do you think they should do to ensure that they have a healthy culture and a healthy uh, environment for their people? It's simple. As long as you have a culture of acceptance. I'm a parent. I was a professional. My wife was a professional. We had a single child. We all struggle. And we struggle with different roles, sisters, brothers, as long. And again, diversity, as I said, right? It's, it doesn't really matter. As long as you build a culture of acceptance and you create a support mechanism for anybody to first say, it's okay for me to ask for help. The biggest issue with mental health that I see is our inability to accept the fact that I have a problem and I need help. Now we have, for example, uh, we, have a, we have a psychologist and psychiatrist available on retainer or on our anonymously for our people to consult. We don't ask questions. We don't ask who. We have no details of session, but we make sure that somebody is available in a safe environment, in a secure environment, to be able to have a conversation and seek help and guidance. So therefore, again, accept and, and make the investments needed to provide that environment for people to say, it's okay, I can take help, and there's no issues. Yeah, on that point, uh, creating the infrastructure to support is the first step, but it's, it's, it's not enough because I'll give you an example. One of the first things I did when I joined a year and a half ago is in my first month, 
I picked up the phone and I dialed our EAP employee assistance program number to fix a appointment with a therapist for myself. I had gone through a tough time. I felt I needed help. More importantly, I wanted to test and let my team know that it was working and it was okay. And I found out some really interesting things. The first time I used the line, it took me about a day because I was a new employee. My number was not registered. So the limited point I make is as a leader, if you have set up these systems for your people, test them yourselves, use them yourself. And then when a team member is in a difficult spot, you can tell them with full confidence, use this, I've used it, it works. And that legitimizes it. That gives them the license to say, okay, if he's open enough about it, maybe, just maybe I can do it too. Thank you, Nikhil. Nandit. There's a lot. It's not just about performance and non-performance anymore. There's a lot that goes on in between. And as leaders uh, setting up businesses, we need to observe and listen um, a lot to know what's going on because um, it's not as, uh, you know, crystal clear as it used to be in the past. Agree. Harji. I I have to agree with Nikhil. I think the most important thing is as leaders, we have to create an environment where it is absolutely okay to ask. And, and we have to actually, if, if we need help, we have to ask and, and make that environment so easy that anybody feels comfortable to do that. It's not easy when you get larger and larger, it becomes harder because people work in different geographies. And I think one of the things that's accelerated this issue is this work from home hybrid model which to me, the flip side is a phenomenal opportunity for diversity and inclusion, because if uh, I'm a newly sort of uh, married person and I have issues of kind of going out of uh, home to work and I'm in a tier two, tier three town in this country, now today they can get jobs. It's important, right? Uh, or if you uh, are a single mother and you need help, you know, there are opportunities to build on some of these networks that are out there. But the question is to ask and create a culture where it's absolutely fine to ask any question. Sure, yeah. thanks, Arjeev. Closing remarks from So yeah, I think I'll cut it short. I think it shouldn't be, for an organization, shouldn't be just a buzzword. There has to be an intent behind it. And you need to keep working towards that intent is what I would just say. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you everyone for attending the panel and listening to us. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you.